All right, well, hey, everybody, this is Ben. I am here with the Defend Your Ground podcast. We're on episode 41. I'm excited to announce that today we have a special guest. Uh, we reached out to Utah State Treasurer Marlo Oaks. Uh, we've been diving into the Securities and Exchange Commission has recently released a rule to create a new type of company called a natural asset company that will impact how public land is managed. It'll impact how a lot of natural resources are managed. And Treasurer Oaks, um, we wanted you to come in and talk about this, but why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how, how you got here? How, how, did, how does one become a treasurer in the state of like Utah? <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. So uh, it was really a, after the 2020 election, my predecessor found a different job. And so there was a, a special process that, that is uh, outlined in statute on how to replace somebody in, in, in between elections. And, and so I went through that process. There were uh, 10 people that applied and, and I came out the, the back end on that. Yeah, and you, you've been reelected since, right? Correct. You know, there was a yeah, special so election, was, yeah. and now the people exactly. of Utah have come together and given you another term. And and so most people probably don't know who their state treasurer is. I spent a lot of my life not knowing who my state treasurer is, even though that is an elected position. You know, people kind of vote for those. and um, But you're one of the ones I know. You've kind of made a name for yourself at, in... A lot of, because we're seeing a lot of changes in our financial markets. There's a lot of political agenda that's being implemented through influencing how financial markets work. And so there's been a kind of a movement where state treasurers have stepped up and started saying, well, we're elected people. We can influence these policy outcomes by using the weight of our states and the bully pulpit that we have in these elected positions. And you have done that. You're one of the few treasurers out there that I know is really trying to move the needle on some of these things. So why don't you tell us a little about some of the big things you're concerned about, and then I want to talk about this Wall Street Journal opinion editorial you published about the natural asset companies. So Yeah, yeah. So so really the state treasurer is um, a pretty technical role. Mm -hmm. um, has very specific, um, you know, function, uh, really over overseeing money in the state. Um, it's, it's not an accounting role per se. You know, it's not... Uh, auditing, and there's an auditor for that. Um, it's more uh, oversight of investment dollars. Uh, and, and so I think of the treasurer's office as sort of the crossroads of politics and the capital markets. Mm -hmm. Not that it's a, a, a policy role necessarily, it's just a, a political position just by virtue of, of being an elected official who operates in the capital markets. And, and because of my professional experience you know, having spent 17, over 17 years in the, in the investment world um, and then also doing banking, uh, that has given me a foundation for what's going on today in the capital markets, um, things like environmental, social governance. Uh, it's really the politicization of our capital markets and, and what I think are, are very uh, potentially dangerous trends in our country because I view economic freedom as we have in the United States, our free market system, um, that, that's really a foundational freedom. If we don't have economic freedom, the ability to uh, you know, get a job that we wanna get, uh, we choose ourselves and how we spend our money. If we don't have those freedoms, then we really don't have any other freedoms. So I, I really came into the role not realizing uh, how far ESG had come. Mm -hmm. And, but once I saw that, I, I felt like I needed to say something that the states would have to step up because the private market and the private industry was really under a tremendous uh, pressure to adopt these kinds of policies that will ultimately replace our free market system. Yeah. And so for people who don't know, like environmental, social governance standards, I mean, what they basically said is that when a when a company is reporting on its financial health or performance, that they have to factor in these. So instead of having something like very understandable, like profitability yeah. is how our financial performance is measured, they they brought in politics. Correct. And how well is your company performing politically, yeah. not profitably? Yeah. And, and it could affect a state, right? If, yeah. if, if, if a state like Utah, we have, like I tell people, we have the best credit in the world. Um, but if we have a separate ESG rating, 
then that may not matter because people yeah. in the marketplace can point to our ESG score and say, well, yeah, Utah is the best credit in the world, but look at what they're doing on the policy side, right? They don't have the right policies in place. Well, the United States of America, there's, it's like 50 different little, you know, mini labs of, of democracy that go on. We don't all look the same. Yeah. We don't all have the same politics and, and we shouldn't necessarily. And we have different natural resource bases. We have different human capital bases Absolutely. and you, and a state needs to be able to adapt to that. And these ESG metrics and scores all seem to be very monolithic and orthodox and, mm -hmm. and, and, and many, in most cases, like very left wing. And so it's a, and so it's been controversial, but companies have been under pressure and they certainly don't want to be They, I don't think anyone expected corporate America to be the ones to do anything other than go along with this. <laughs> um, and, but it was interesting to see the state treasurers rise up and do this. I mean, you're not the only state treasurer raising alarm bells about this. Right. right? No. Right. Yeah. There's there's there are several others. And, and, you know, it's important to remember that our capital markets have have not been politicized in the past. And so what I tell people is it's an, the underlying politics isn't the problem necessarily, because mm -hmm. you could have politics on the right or the left. It's just the fact that politics are being pushed through the capital markets. That's the problem. It doesn't matter which side of the aisle they come from. We should not have politics being pushed through the capital markets. And, and that's ultimately what I am against. Uh, yeah, now there's CSG. You hear people say we need to get money out of politics, and it's like now we need to get politics out of our money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, that's right. Um, but so the natural asset companies then, and so ESG is a little different. I mean, that's kind of what I watched you kind of step into this role. You were very vocal about the ESG scoring, and um, I believe there were like movements where, I mean, the assets that Utah has, I mean, because it, like states have investments. I mean, I mean yeah. I'm assuming you manage like the portfolios for like the state employee pension funds. So I sit on the board of, of the retirement system. So I'm yeah. one of seven um, trustees on that board. But then we do have a, a money market fund um, that has uh, about 30 billion. I mean, so it's a big fund, you know, and a yeah. lot of different entities around the state, cities, counties, uh, universities, they'll invest um, short term money in that portfolio. So we actually mm -hmm. oversee that here. Uh, and then um, CITFO, which is kind of the trust lands portfolio, I'm the chairman of the, uh, that board of trustees that oversee those investments. Yeah. So a lot of investments, different kinds of pools. And as somebody who oversees all that, I mean, there is a role you can play in sort of saying, we're not going to play along with this ESG game. And isn't that kind of what the state treasurers were decided to step up and do? Yeah, so because really, if you, it, it, it's really an effort to protect the capital markets. If you think about ESG as a thumb on the scale, mm -hmm. um, my efforts are really to pull the thumb, thumb off of the scale and allow capital to go where it would naturally go. Um, ESG is coming in saying, oh, you can't put capital with fossil fuel or you can't, you know, mm -hmm. can't do this. With that Even though there's a great return on investment there. Uh, right, like you, right. And so... Yeah, so that was like the first thing, and, and the conversations I've seen people have that are watching this space, and it's a small world that is, mm -hmm. but there is people, there are people watching it. Uh, now they're starting to see that the branding around ESG kind of got a little toxic, and because of this, like because people yeah. like you and others were raising attention about it, and probably for good reasons. Uh, but they, but these people are creative, the ones that want to transform our capital markets and transform our environmental policy, transform our social governmental policies. And so we've now seen this new proposals out there to create what are called natural asset companies. And I mm -hmm. first started reading about these about a year ago. You've heard of like the Rockefeller Fund and the New York Stock Exchange were contemplating doing this. And when I first read it, it was, I read this, I'm like, this is nuts. It sounds like conspiracy theory land, but it's, but I could see that how this would play out. So I'm going to pay attention to it. Uh, this October, we finally saw it materialize in the form of a Securities and Exchange Commission rulemaking that got published in the Federal Register. I've talked about this on other podcasts and content, and, and I, so I know the page number. <laughs> it was page <laughs> <That's> sixty-eight thousand <impressive. laughs> wow. eight hundred and eleven of the Federal Register. And so for those who don't know what the Federal Register is, this is where actually all our laws get made. If you think your laws are being made by the Congress, uh, <laughs> you have been deceived, my friend. Um, there's, the Federal Register tends to be about 100,000 pages a year. 
They publish a new issue just about every day, and this is every agency in the federal government releases all of the rules it's wanting to change. Mm -hmm. These rules tend to have the force of law, so you have the people making these tend to be the decision makers in these agencies, so the agency heads or some of their deputies. And so those are the ones making these rules that have the force of law, and then they put them in the federal register. And there's usually a legally required public participation process, so people can come in and share their concerns about this. And that's what we saw start in October. And that really was the first moment where it's like, this is becoming real. There's real money behind this, real political power. We have a federal government agency that's making serious moves to make this a reality. Uh, you wrote an opinion editorial about this. Give everybody like the five second definition, like what is a NAC, a natural asset company, and why were you so concerned about this that you wrote an opinion editorial in the Wall Street Journal to let people know what these are and why you're concerned? Yeah, so basically natural asset company uh, is a new creation um, that would re require uh, an SEC rule because uh, it really goes to the accounting of a natural asset company. The company is not built to make a profit per se in the traditional way that we think of. Uh, and so traditional accounting doesn't apply. Um, and so the uh, natural asset companies would use a UN uh, economic or uh, ecological, economic, some, you know, it's it's combination of sort of econo e ecological Processes they call that are trying the to value. ecological performance or the ecosystem services. These are like the buzzwords yeah, they yeah, use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're using a, a UN um, created accounting mechanism to apply value to ecological services, uh, really natural processes that are happening um, in nature. The, the you know the creation of clean air mm -hmm. by taking in carbon and you know trees uh, em emitting oxygen. Uh, what is that worth? Um, what is uh, clean water worth? You know, when it's it gets soaked into the ground and and becomes a, a an aquifer under under the ground. What it, what about um, uh, the absorption of carbon in the soil? Mm -hmm. um, the uh, what's the value of soil that is um, ideal for growing crops? Uh, it's really putting a value on things that we might think of as sort of God-given processes that, you know, were, were always part of nature yeah. and we never tried to value. Uh, and, and so because, because it requires a completely different accounting system, um, the, the New York Stock Exchange went to the SEC and said, we need a rule to approve this. Um, and, and so we've seen through the rulemaking process over the last um, three years with this administration, uh, just it, it's really um, become a major part of this, you know, kind of whole of government approach. And, and it's really animated by the climate narrative, mm -hmm. the climate crisis. Right. So, I mean, I, so it, I can kind of wrap my head around this that we need new accounting procedures for this. And and I think for most people, that's still kind of hard to wrap your head around the fact that this air you breathe, the fact that the oxygen, the naturally occurring oxygen in the atmosphere has an economic value. I mean, I guess it does, but we're going to somehow try to securitize or privatize that in some ways. What's going to happen out of this? And people have like questioned my words where I'm like, I'm saying they're going to sell off our PAPA plans and our natural resources. They're like, well, they're technically not selling them. They're leasing them. I'm just like, okay, it's a privatization. <laughs> of a public good in some ways, but you've read the rulemaking. How big do they expect this market to be? This isn't just oh, a fringe huge. little special project for, if, it's not a niche. Like how no. big do they, what are the numbers? Uh, four to five quadrillion. Yes, the, I, mean, I know, just, that's the number I've said and people yeah. debate. Like, are they, have a hard time believing that I'm serious about that. Yeah. But they, in the actual rulemaking, they say, we see the carbon sequestration economy as a model for this, and that's trillions of dollars in size, and we see this as being orders of magnitude larger of an economic opportunity than what we're currently seeing in the carbon markets. And so that just raises a big question for me, because your article says these companies can't make money, but these people are in the business of making money. They're not going to engineer something into existence. 
that doesn't make them quadrillions of dollars. If they're telling us they're going to go make quadrillions of dollars off of this, I take them at their word. So, but you don't end up on Wall Street as a firm, as a publicly traded company or anything with billions of dollars on your balance sheet unless you've provided value to somebody else or you've somehow managed a way to engineer money through investment returns. And that means that money's coming out of somebody else's pocket into yours. Like whose pocket is this money coming out of that's going to go into the balance sheet of these four quadrillion dollars worth of natural asset companies? Like who's paying yeah, for this? No, that's a great question. And, and um, the, the op-ed, um, I think the notion of them not being able to make money isn't accurate. They won't make money in the traditional way. Yeah. Right. Um, no, for um, but uh, what does that mean? It, it essentially means that that we are looking to financialize nature mm -hmm. uh, and, and put a price tag on nature and na nature's process. So um, one of the thoughts that I have, and I don't know, you know how this will play out, but there is a big push for net zero. I mean, we see that everywhere, right? We're, we're pushing for net zero by 2030 or 2050, right? Just kind of depending on, on the sector. Um, well, how do you get to net zero? If you still have fossil fuels, you're gonna have companies that are emitting carbon. Well, if we start tracking that carbon and there's a big push to track carbon, then how will you offset your carbon footprint? Yeah. Well, a natural asset company is the perfect vehicle potentially for doing that. If you are calculating how much carbon can be taken out of the atmosphere and processed back into oxygen through you know, photosynthesis, right? And, and, and things that happen in nature. That, that to me is sort of how this comes together and pushes a, a market that could become incredibly valuable, but it's based on, it's based on uh, arbitrary value for, for natural processes. And it's based on uh, artificially pushing uh, companies to become net zero. What, what, what value does that bring uh, you know, to the overall economy? I mean, it's a huge potential drain on, on resources. Uh, yeah, so, so I think to answer my question and based on what you just said is the person whose pocket this is gonna come out of is gonna be mine. Yeah, when I pay for my my energy bill every mm -hmm. month or when I pay to fill up my car. And, and I think most people will be like, well, yeah, we've been talking about putting prices on carbon for a long time. But then I read this rule and say the carbon market, which isn't even fully developed or mature. I mean, President Obama tried to create a cap and exchange kind of market that could have fueled and, something yeah, like this. And those and never succeed. really, they really haven't succeeded. They haven't gotten off the ground. But I think that if you were to talk to the most committed climate advocates, they think that sometime in the future, that's going to become absolutely necessary. If the crisis gets so bad, eventually people will give in and that will be, mm -hmm. the policy solution will be ready for that moment. And but they're saying that's just a model for financializing nature. So does this mean that if I'm going to build a house made out of wood and I go cut down a tree that, that, and that requires that, is there some other, is there like a cap and trade market on wood products and on lithium and on anything? I mean, you look around your office here, there's drywall, there's paint, there's wood, there's glass, there's books, there's paper. There, are all of these things going to have an environmental cost aside from what's already baked in there through the, I mean, in an economy, the cost of extracting goods and services and natural resources out of an economy get baked into the prices. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to insert frictional costs into all of that if they're really going to turn this into a quadrillion dollar market, right? I mean, this can't just... It's not going to get to quadrillions of dollars just off of carbon pollution. Right, right. And so they're going to, anything that causes an environmental, like, can I save money by breathing fewer times in a day? Right, like, right. I don't know what it's they're, just, like. It, 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 it causes your mind to wander uh, yeah. in, a lot of, in a lot of directions because that is a massive number. Uh, and we've never contemplated quantifying all of these processes that, that are, just they just happen, yeah. right? And, and and the fact that we're we're actually moving in that direction should be a, a concern. Just just the concept, um, because when you start measuring something and managing it, 
and putting a dollar value, somebody's paying for it yeah. and somebody's benefiting from it. And it's you and me. Yeah, it's going to be the consumer. Yeah, and, ultimately, and most all likely costs, the American consumer is going to probably yes. be where the biggest target's placed on all of this. Mm -hmm. and, so, and, and that says nothing of the um, the the impact on uh, tying up resources. Yeah, and the fact that you're not extracting resources right causes a potential, you know, scarcity. Yeah, the scarcity element. So, I mean, there's a lot of. Uh, economic implications here. So let's talk about, I mean, I'm, I'm the executive director of the Blue Ribbon Coalition. Our members are mostly in, involved in this and caring about it because of the impact it might have on outdoor recreation on public land, which I think is probably just a small drop in the bucket of what this is going to encompass. Mm -hmm. But if that's something you care about, it's going to be a big drop in the bucket because it's going to dramatically change how public lands get managed. Utah has 67% of its state as public land. Other mm -hmm. states in the West are just as much or higher or close to it. Uh, in the rulemaking, they say one of the ways that these investors will get a return on investment is through ecotourism right. and recreation. And so if you're an organization like ours that is interested in the recreation access to public land, what, do you th what should we be worried about? No, that's a, that's a really good question. I, and I think there's a, a very important book called Nudge, and it came out in 2011, I think, something like that, and, and really the concept is to slowly move things in the direction that you want them to go. Mm -hmm. and, and so initially, the impact to recreation might be minimal, but over time, that's going to grow, and it's going to be, you know, so suddenly you can't uh, take your electric bicycle uh, on, on forest service, uh, you, you know, you have to be unmotorized trails instead of the non-motorized trails. That was a rule that, yeah. that just came out. No, I know. And, well, not just that, but it's like, just nobody recreates on Utah's public land without some sort of motorized access. Right. Everybody's getting at least to the trailhead in a yeah. vehicle, and that causes an impact. And so you're gonna have to pay to offset that somehow. Uh, but one trend we, we're seeing is that one of, I think, Utah's best recreation experiences is just to go camp for free mm -hmm. on public BLM yeah. land. Yeah. And that's all getting shut down. I'm in litigation right now with organizations like the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance and others who are, are concerned that the BLM isn't getting more rigorous in regulating things like dispersed camping and other all these experiences that most generations of Americans in the last hundred years have kind of taken for granted. And everything's moving towards reservation systems, ticketed entry. Yep. And you're only allowed to go to a few hardened sites where we can control access and we can charge fees for it. Mm -hmm. And so this open, free, public recreation experience on public land, I think with the advent of a NAC, they need to get a return on investment. There were, that will just throw gas on the fire of everything's going to have to be managed through these lotteries, the, the fee gated entry stuff. And in some ways, I mean, they're using that to solve overcrowding, but you're building the, find the technological infrastructure of all these systems to basically say, well, we can do this on any acre or any resource recreation amenity we want now. Yeah. And so Booz Allen Hamilton is the company, the concessionaire or the contractor that runs like recreation.gov. And mm. they're just like printing money off of this. And, mm. uh, and to just scale that system to more and more nicks and crannies of our public land, that's how I think it affects our outdoor recreation. And, and then aside from that, it's just the loss of control. They say the most valuable parts of the, what would become the system of NACs mm -hmm. will be unimpaired, unimproved, vacant, rural, right. natural land. Yep. And Utah has that in abundance. You have, but then what that definition means becomes really, like I would very much disagree. I, I would say if I were to go out to these areas around Moab, I would say, even with all the outdoor recreation activity, this still fits the definition of that. Mm -hmm. Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance would go look and say, no, 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 no. This needs to be designated wilderness, and that's a higher level of right. protection and limitation of access mm -hmm. and use. And, and the NAC is going to create a financial incentive for the creation of things like wilderness. And, and that means to restrictive management, restricted access, fewer and fewer people are able to go and have a limited range of experiences on those lands. And so that's why we're so but fired it doesn't, up. But it doesn't start there. No. Right? It, it starts very incrementally by saying, very much so. right? Um, 
we should, you know, do this and we promise that it's not going to impact. You'll still have access, right? And you'll still be able to do all these things. And then that's what's told to get people on board with, with change, right? Mm-hmm. But then, then it ratchets up another level, right? And before you know it, your BLM land is now wilderness uh, area and, and suddenly you have to get permits to access and, right? I mean, it just- Yeah, or none time. at all. Uh, and, and then, then you have, what well, will be in this case, some very well-funded organizations making great returns on investment for that being how things get managed. You're gonna create a huge incentive in the system where right now the Bureau of Land Management and others have had to kind of have a multiple use balanced approach to how they manage things. This is going to tilt the scales towards big, big money. And it'll, I think it'll make big oil look small. Mm-hmm. And so to the extent that big industries like the oil industry have had, had, have played a role in our public land system, when in some cases, in some areas, they kind of are the center of gravity of it. Um, I think everybody gets displaced with this. And then there will be one interest that's just commandeering all of it. Well, yeah, I mean, this is really, um, on, on, one, on one hand, it's really locking up our natural resources um, and, and really putting tremendous power in the hands of sort of the, the deepest pockets. Um, and it's really counter to what we think of as America where you want a dispersion of power and you, know, you have all these different institutions that have different amounts of power. And we don't yeah. want any power consolidating too much into well, one area. And especially our public land system. I mean, yes, I mean, that's, you, you know, say what you want about Teddy Roosevelt, but he wasn't a Westerner. He mm-hmm. was from New York with his friends from, I mean, they were Wall Street and they knew what Wall Street looked, was thinking when they looked at the West and saw all the minerals and all the natural, and, and they were the ones that said, we are going to create all these national preserves in the forest system. And I'll, to counterbalance the weight of the federal government against what we see is happening. And so the public land system was made in this moment of, we're not going to let just the deep pockets come in and commandeer all of this. And over time that's created this mindset among people that these lands belong to all of us. It's a public good and a public benefit that should be enjoyed by as many people as possible. This is going to change that permanently. If these things come into effect, there's no way around it. The BLM, they released a rule this summer where they want to, without any co- rules in law to allow them to do this, they want to sell conservation leases. And everyone was kind of like scratching their heads like, where's this coming from? Who are they going to sell this to? And then the NAC rule comes out a few months. And it's like, okay, all the pieces are coming together now. Yes. Yeah. And so they're embracing the idea of this. Yeah. And, and really the conservation lease would replace the multi, multiple use doctrine, right? That's been in place where all, all the, this land could be used for a lot of different purposes. Mm-hmm. And there's easy access for people, and you know it's it's um, uh, the situation that we've enjoyed for decades, and and that would be completely changed with conservation leases, which would take priority over multiple use on. Yeah, and, the they, and they're very clear about that. Is that there will be management prescriptions written into those leases? The NACs are saying we'll have the management authority over the mm-hmm. land, and that so once you sign onto this lease as a as a BLM decision maker, I mean you've basically turned yourself into a potted plant like you're, yeah uh, and so and i've seen and it's very hard once you have a lease existing on a public land system i've worked with ranchers i've worked with miners and i've seen i've seen like there's like there is an example of what they ha- there's a memorandum of understanding that i'm aware of that includes what i think would be like a model for these conservation leases down in san juan county and the environmental groups that entered into it with the with the agency I and mean, they're not upholding the terms and conditions of it Mm. Uh, but in that situation, there's not a lot of accountability baked into this of how do you make them uphold it or does the lease now cancel? And then it, and then it turns very political it, it's, mm. and potentially legal. And so that's why I look at this rule and I don't think the SEC is even remotely thinking, well, how's this gonna impact our public land system? They're, it, they don't have the expertise to analyze right. that in the first place. They, mm. are, they are focused on Wall Street and preventing fraud and securities fraud and all that, like their job is not public land management, that's other agencies. And that gets to the point of, that's ultimately why we don't want agencies making these rules with their own narrow field of vision of what their expertise is. That's right. We have another body of government called the Congress. Yeah. They have committees, they're elected by the people and, they, and there's a broad, that 
a Congress member is going to look at this, so like in Utah, our members of Congress, if, they, if this was put before them, they would ask the question, how does this affect public land? Because they have to. They'll be pressured to by people like me and the constituents in their state. But as long as this is done on page 68,811 of the Federal Register, right. you're sidestepping all of those important questions, displacing the institution in our government that has the best role to play in taking a broad view of how is this rule going to affect everything mm -hmm. and making sure that it's done well and done right instead of does this get the New York Stock Exchange what they want. Right. And that's... Well, and there was such a short uh, period uh, comment window. Yeah. And we, unusually short. Unusually short. And we've all been asking for extensions to that. I know that a letter got sent out today, I believe, by Representative Hegman's office asking for an extension. I mean, I know there's people that want this looked at a lot. More and it should be because yeah. it's such a drastic change. I mean, only four quadrillion dollars. Like, <laughs> like, this is just it's it's not, dramatic. And that, I mean, and I know in Congress there's been laws that haven't been passed yet, but there's one called the Rains Act, where they basically say any agency rulemaking that affects more than a hundred million dollars of economic activity needs to have the Congress needs to eventually vote on that and authorize whether that mm -hmm. actually goes into effect. That's $100 million is when they're saying, this is getting a little too big for your britches, federal right. agency. And, the, and here's the SEC waltzing in with a $4 quadrillion <laughs> proposal. I'm like, hey, maybe we should just do this. <laughs> what do you think about the, the NAC idea? Yeah. And so that's, what, that's a big problem I have with this, is it's just not the right way to do government. Even if these are a good idea and there are people who like them, right. go through the actual legislative process to make sure it's done right. And I, I don't know that you can get this one right. I'm very concerned about where this goes. I want to end with one last thing. Uh, you raised it in your opinion editorial. I raised it in the comments we shared on Blue Ribbon Coalition. The global geopolitical environment right now, I mean, we definitely have like a shifting of the global order, China and Russia, the United States of America, all the big powers are rearranging how their relationships exist with each other for, in some ways, quite dramatically. Uh, and neither of those powers are probably ever gonna like go into like a direct confrontation with the United States, but they've learned they can use soft power to kind of influence our policy environment here in the United States of America. And one thing they care a lot about is their economies depend on natural resource extraction, manufacturing, and all these things. And so, like, when Trump came into office and we, gave, we became energy independent in, like, a yeah. few years, that was, like, a, a globally destabilizing move where the United States of America woke up for a moment and just said, you know what, we have the natural resources here to not be held hostage by OPEC and all these other... And, and, that, and so everybody's, like, reshuffling that. You don't really see a lot mentioned in this rule about the NACs, about how this might influence our foreign policy, other than... We expect and contemplate that foreign capital will be used to invest in these. Yeah. And so they, they, they just seem to be very open minded and accepting of the fact that we want foreign capital to come and fund these NACs and to buy up natural resources in this country. And so is that a legitimate concern or am I just like nutty conspiracy theory land on this well, one? You, you think about, or you just have to look at the amount of uh, capital that are in. China, um, Russia, their their sovereign wealth funds, Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. hundreds of billions of dollars. And what better way to have an impact on on a potential adversary than to go in and and put money to work that locks up natural resources? I mean, man, that that's a no brainer. And, and like I know that. <laughs> Folks, I have friends of mine that exist in like the defense industries, the intelligence, they call this like gray zone competition where they just, there are different tools and levers they can use to weaken our geopolitical standing. And this is absolutely one that they would play. Oh, this is a great They'd one. play this card every time absolutely. they possibly could. And so I, I think that if the SEC is not taking a really hard look at how it would regulate how foreign capital flows into these, mm -hmm. then it's just opening the door for a disaster. Yeah. And that's another reason Congress has things like the Foreign Relations Committees and the Armed Services Committees and the Intelligence Committees where they can go and bring those issues up. And the development of a proposal like this, and so to do this through an SEC rulemaking just seems really like a terrible idea. Yeah, well, and, and, it, and it's par for the course for the administration who's using this whole of government approach mm -hmm. to, to address climate change 
and and we see the impact the on whole our government systems. except Congress because they can't <laughs> get the support of the, <laughs> the people whole, the whole the whole the executive branch yeah <laughs> right <laughs> exactly yeah so anyway well that's the discussion I wanted to have and you raised some great points some great points in your editorial uh, is if you learn more about what's going on with these as this develops happy to come talk again right um, any last words you want to leave with our audience and with folks that well, well I, I, I just think this is something that we all need to oppose if, if we care about our natural resources here in the United States. Um, and, uh, you know, we should be concerned about how those are managed, um, including recreational access. I mean, that's, there are so many implications here, and, and we really need to, to um, go through the proper process because this has the potential to lock up so much of, of America in, in ways that could be long-term and short-term detrimental to us. Yeah, well, thank you for that concern. We've been encouraging our members to oppose this and share their concerns with the SEC, with their members of Congress. And I just wanna end with, I mean, you bring up recreation. A lot of times people say, ah, oh, it's just outdoor recreation. It, but these things are way bigger and more important. And the Bureau of Economic Analysis came out with, they do a yearly study on outdoor recreation economy and, they estimate that it's a trillion dollars now in the United mm, States wow. in the amount of people spend on outdoor recreation. And so it isn't just some afterthought. This right. is like people's jobs, their livelihood. This yeah. underwrites the economies of probably hundreds, if not thousands, of small little towns throughout the rural United yeah. States. And so it's an, it, we think it's an important consideration in all of this. And we appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about it. Thank you. 